to us from a thin brochure as she marched around the room. She had the deep, loud voice of a person who talked for a living. My mother had the same voice. She had hosted political awareness sessions in schools and factories for years. Although Maria Mikhailovna read very well, nobody seemed to listen. Some teachers chatted. Others read Young Moscovite, a new daily paper that printed only shocking stories, an old in Russian. A few days earlier, I read an article about a dog that had bitten off her owner's genitals when the owner tried to rape her. And a month earlier, about the gang called the Skinners, whose members kidnapped fat people, skinned them alive, and made hamburgers out of them. Maria Mikhailovna stopped hesitantly next to me, pausing in her reading. She shifted her weight from one foot to the other, sighed, and touched the back of my chair. I stopped breathing. But then the floorboard creaked, and she started walking away. I took a few quick breaths and lifted my eyes. She was definitely walking away from me, tapping the palm of her hand with her brochure. The brochure was entitled Sex Education Diseases. The Ministry of Education had sent it to every school that year to introduce sex education in the 10th grade. Now the faculty had to pick two sex, two sex education teachers. I had good reason to worry. Whenever there was an unpleasant errand or assignment that nobody wanted to do, supervising monthly school dances and weekly yard cleanings, taking students on trips to Lenin, Lenin's tomb, riding out to a bakery to buy a cake for the teacher's tea, Maria Mikhailovna picked me, our young teacher. She always referred to me as our young teacher. He used a reward ma made young sound like a mark of inferiority and inevitable failure. Sometimes she peeped into my room during class, sticking her pink face inside the door and leaving her heavy body outside. She watched me teach for a few minutes, which made me sweat, sputter, confused words, and drop my chalk onto the floor. If one of my students so much as stirred or smiled, she said, shame on you, don't you respect your young teacher? Or, we know she's young and it's very hard for her to handle you, so help her. Show some respect. I kept my eyes down and dug my fingernails into the flesh of my palms. I wished that the most horrible things would happen to Maria Mikhailovna. I fantasized about her getting caught by the Skinners and turned into a hamburger. Sergei wasn't very old to experience either, but Maria Mikhailovna never referred to him as our young teacher. She called him our male teacher with affection and awe, as if his gender were an admirable character trait. Sergei had naturally had just been appointed to teach sex education to the boys. He didn't mind. He seemed to know enough about sex. Every Friday, a different smart girl in nice imported clothes stood waiting for him on the school porch after classes. Every Friday, I watched from my classroom window, half hidden, behind dusty flannel curtains. At 3.40, Sergei would appear on the porch in faded jeans and a dark short with the top two buttons undone, carrying a wrinkled jacket and a crumpled pack of cigarettes. From my four-story window, his back looked like a little slouchy. Sergei wasn't very handsome, but it didn't matter to me. Not that I was in love with Sergei. What I felt for him was nothing compared to what I had felt for Prince Andrei from War and Peace, or for the math teacher from my hometown, or for the famous actor Alexei Batalov, who played the fatally ill nuclear physicist in my favorite movie, Nine Days of One Year. I wasn't in love with Sergei, but I would have liked if he looked at me with a promising expression.